if you would like to carry on the conversation outside of the webinar. During the presentation, all attendees will be muted and cameras turned off. At the end of the presentation, I will chair the question and answer session. If you have a question, please use the chat box function to write your question at any time during the presentation. Or if you would like to ask your question in person, wait to the end and you can use the raise hand icon to ask. Um, I will see this and I will unmute you and this will prompt a box to appear on your screen that you need to accept so you can ask the question. Right, so I hope that's that's all clear. Um, I say, I've got not doing well, overrun already. Um, that's enough from me. So I will now hand you over to Eric from Earth Science Analytics. And they will present the work they have done and their sort of machine learning approach to geoscience. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Ian. So, yeah, while we get our slides up, I'll just introduce myself. I'm uh, Eric Larson. I'm a co-founder and the CEO of uh, Earth Science Analytics. And um, before we start, I'd like to start with saying a big thank you to the OGTC and all the stakeholders, the MPD, the OGA, all the operators for providing the data and for giving us the opportunity to take part in this uh, very exciting project. Uh, we have learned a lot uh, executing this project and developed uh, and refined our tools uh, a lot uh, along the way. Uh, Earth Science Analytics is a software company. Uh, we deliver cloud native and AI assisted software uh, to geoscientists. Uh, our platform, uh, EarthNet, uh, is the first platform that provides. Uh, an integrated set of GNG uh, applications that run in the browser uh, that use cloud computing and machine learning technology to enable the geoscientists to get the maximum value of their very large and very diverse uh, data sets. We're based in uh, Norway uh, and Greece and also in, in the UK. Um, on our team, we have a good mix of geoscience uh, staff, computer science staff, and data science staff. Uh, we have identified and characterized missed pay intervals in uh, around 5,000 wells using big data analytics and machine learning techniques. And we believe that a project of this scale uh, has never been done before. And so we hope now that the exploration community will take the results that we uh, will be providing and going out there to do some uh, successful uh, near field exploration. We believe in integrating all the data. And so that includes not only the well data that we will be seeing in the presentation today, but also seismic data. So if you flip to the next slide, Daniel, we, we can see that we also provide technology for 3D property prediction. So we predict uh, properties such as porosity, lithology, litter fluid classes, and even source rock properties directly based on both well data and seismic. Uh, we do automatic seismic uh, interpretation also using deep learning. So in order to make this kind of integrated geoscience platform work, obviously we need a solid data platform as the foundation. And this is what we call our Earth Bank uh, data platform. So that's where we host all the well data, all the wireline logs, core data, fluid samples, well tops, seismic data, inversion results, interpretation, everything. It all comes together in one platform. And the results that we will be showing today were all generated using this EarthNet platform. So with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Daniel, to uh, present on behalf of our team, the results of our study. Okay, thank you, Eric, for that uh, introduction. Um, Firstly, I'd just like to thank uh, TACA, our sponsors, 
uh, for providing um, data and support and discussions along the way. So we were, um, our remit was to look for missed pay and to identify missed pay candidates. And when we have identified the missed pay candidates, it is to characterize those candidates in terms of mean porosity and mean water saturation, and also then, and then go about ranking those candidates. And we think we can only achieve this by leveraging the machine learning methodology and modern day thinking. And the fourth, the fourth element was to try and visualize the data. <clears throat> So what I want to do is basically show you up front the type of data that we are going to get. So this is a, a missed pay prediction from uh, quadrant 211. It's well 211.16b7. We see here on the left in the, in the blue a, uh, um, a predicted porosity curve. We then have a predicted water saturation curve we have a caliper flag and we have a pay zone flag. So what you can see here immediately is that we have a nice uh, decrease in water saturation within the Tarbot, Ness, Etiv and Rannoch formations. <clears throat> and we have a corresponding increase in porosity. So this well was drilled in 1991 by Mobile and the OGA has classified this as a, as a dry hole. Um, there was no significant oil shows seen in the well, but there was some tarry black oil seen within the Brent formation. So we began looking into this, into this well and we did a, a search on the OGA website. And what we found was a relinquishment report from Zenor. And they concluded that there was, there was probably an oil column in the Brent with an oil down to and a free water level up to. And the depths of these oil water, uh, sorry, oil down, oil down to contacts and free water levels are beyond the limit of the local fault bounded closure, which indicates there was potentially a larger trap to the north. So what's interesting is kind of the concept of mispay. What mispay for me, uh, something that is mispay for me is obviously not mispay to Zen or. So therefore it begins a, a discussion about uh, what exactly mispay is. So I'm just going to outline um, what we're going to talk about in the talk. One is about the missed pay concept and the possible reasons for missed pay. Um, we're then going to showcase our missed pay predi uh, prediction workflow, our ML workflow, where they're going to visualize results. And then at the very end, we're going to have a 10 minute demo of the software. So here we have a, a definition of a pay interval. I thought I'd put this up straight away. Um, a reservoir, a uh, pay interval is a reservoir, a portion of a reservoir that contains economically producible hydrocarbons. And this is uh, the discovery well from the Gulfax field, the 3410 well. We see here that we have uh, um, good oil saturations within the Tarbot, Ness, Etiv and Rannick formations with a corresponding increase in porosity. I think we're all very happy that this is a, a nice um, hydrocarbon pay zone. And then we have um, two zones above that uh, in the Shetland group where oil have been registered in um, fractured limestones and in siltstones. And we register these in our predicted water saturation logs and there is some porosity within those zones as well. So the operator had drilled through this zone many times and recognized the oil shows. And then they go and test these horizons in 2012. And they see that basically there is producible oil and their estimates are between 140 and 150 million barrels recoverable. Now, you know, we don't know whether this was missed pay or not. Um, uh, we, can only, we, can only, we can only guess, but actually the concept is a nice one is that We've discovered oil in a mature field, and then we discover years later missed pay above the field. And we see that many uh, billion barrel discoveries in the North Sea do leak. So the possible reasons for missed pay, this is not an exhaustive list or a list that is in order, a preference. Um, and I'll just highlight some of these, of course, a poor petrophysical evaluation 
could give us a, uh, a missed pay opportunity. Um, bad hold conditions or looking at pay at casting points. Focus, of, uh, focus on the larger hydrocarbon discoveries and missing some of the, uh, the thinner pay zones uh, either above or below that discovery, that could be a reason. And also with time, new geological plays and, and information comes on board. You know, we just see the, the quantum leap in uplift of seismic resolution by, by, the, uh, by the broadband seismic. And also loss of knowledge and experience. You see that the boom and bust cycles of the oil and gas industry mean that people do leave the industry with considerable knowledge. Um, and this cannot be this cannot be claimed back in many cases. <clears throat> so the workflow. The workflow has, uh, has six steps. Um, initially, we build a data bank, and in this case of 5,000 wells. So we have a structured database. We then go through a series of data editing and QCing. Uh, this is very important. Um, the adage of rubbish in, rubbish out is very um, apparent in the machine learning industry, so therefore the QC of data is very important. We then do the machine learning, the prediction of our attributes, in this case porosity, water saturation and ethology. And when we've done that, we can then go on and calculate such attributes as, as, as net reservoir, net pay, net to gross, gross interval, thicknesses, etc. Once we've done that, we can then go to pay classification and then of course the visualization and the right ranking goes into that. So a little bit about our database. Our database stretches from the northern part of the East Shetland Basin, East Shetland platform, right down to the flood and ground spur on the UK side. The Norwegian side, Tampen Spur, North Viking Graben, South Viking Graben, right down to the Sleipner area. So the data bank, it contains 70, 70 data types. As I said, it contains um, uh, exploration wells and development wells, 3,000 development wells. We have 1,000 formation tops. We have 30,000 kilometers of basic logs. Um, we also have 155 kilometers of training data. This is uh, CPIs from porosity, lithology, and, uh, and water saturation. And we have a staggering 90 million depth indexes. So you can see that this is a, this, this is a big data project and can only be, I believe, only be um, um, done using the machine learning um, uh, uh, methodology. So we have, the, we have all this data, huge amounts of data, but we really need to know exactly what data we have. Um, so we have a, an explore function in the software. Um, the x-axis is wellbore name and the y-axis is the depth, in this case, measured depth. The columns, uh, the colored columns, in this case is the intervals that contain gamma ray. So just using this, we are able to see which wells A have gamma ray and the coverage of that. And we can even put on the formations on this as well. Um, so we know which formations are covered with gamma ray. And also what's important is not is also not knowing not also knowing where we don't have data. So the panel on the right shows us the wells where we don't have data. So we're able to rifle through our data set knowing exactly where we have data. We can then look at the spatial coverage of that data, see if, uh, if, it, if that data is missing from a certain reservoir, a certain area, or if we're focusing in on a certain area, where, it, where are our data gaps in terms of uh, distributions in a well. Data QC, very important. As I said, rubbish in, rubbish out is very, um, very uh, real. There are a couple of highlights here. One is that we always keep the original data. So if, if accidents happen with our data editing, we're always able to go back and uh, to the original data. And what we, have, what we are adopting is a semi-automated approach for our data QC. 
we have a we have a strong focus on trying to keep all the valuable data we're trying to use all the data we can that's in the database and we also try and keep the data close to us uh, you know we have to have the ability to be able to access access that data easily and to go in and find anomalies find problems with the data solve those issues um, we're also able to edit the data on a large scale using multi-well uh, data edit and also on a single well edit and we also produce a, a bad hole flag using the caliper bit size and the density correction which we found very useful so just there was one point um, the graphs are the xy's to the to the left this is where we have uh, dt versus depth and you can see in the in the uh, the one to the far left we see there is a well plotting away from the large regional trend we recognize this we see that this well is in the wrong units we then correct that and you can see that the data then shows a lot more life in the data so this is a, a schematic workflow uh, that we will uh, that we uh, um, developed so first of all um, this is a, a high level um, schematic workflow and it's built upon several fundamental principles um, one is using all the data another is uh, the, the ability to qc the data and also the validation of our model predictions so once we've imported the data in the in, imported the data features the logs we then go to feature engineering and imputation this is where we're trying to make this is where we're trying to make use of all the data <clears throat> we then create uh, a series of ensemble models which provide us with a more robust and accurate model predictions and we are applying cross validation strategies and classical blind well tests to qc our models and then these go into our master project into our final predictions if we now focus in specifically on the northern north sea ml workflow we input our data our development wells our exploration wells both from norway and the uk we then go through a series of uh, data engineering where we look at what data we have in terms of the features we then make detailed models using that QC data, using the features and also the label sets, the water saturation, the, the, uh, the, the porosity labels that we glean from CPI logs. And then these models are then applied to the three different project areas to give us an ensemble of prediction curves. And the reason why we want an ensemble of prediction of curves is it allows us to have a more robust and better predictions in the end. And in the end, what we are what we are ending up with is a, a, a mean porosity a mean water saturation um, curves for each well, and we also have a standard deviation curve. So this is an example of a porosity prediction and, an, and a blind well QC. You can see the features we use gamma ray, resistivity, density, N phi, DT logs. And the panel, the panel to the uh, to the to the far right shows us where we have the prediction, where we have the blind prediction of porosity and the label. And you can see the two plot very close to each other, meaning that our model is performing well. The cross plot to the uh, to the right is where we have the porosity label plotted against predicted porosity, and you can see a very good correlation with our label data set. This diagram shows the ensemble models, uh, the ensemble curves, sorry, that we get for, for each well. So for each well, we get four curves. And these curves are here are stacked upon each other. We get four curves for water saturation and four curves for porosity. And then what we do is we basically form the means of those curves and form the standard deviation, calculate the standard deviation. So this is our end product. So now we can go towards pay classification. So we have our, 
we have our uh, mean porosity, our mean water saturation curves. So what we've done is we've basically set up a um, uh, pay classes um, based upon our water saturation cutoffs and our porosity cutoffs. So we have pay class one, two, and three, four, where we have hydrocarbons and pay, pay class five and non-pay um, are, are predominantly water saturated um, intervals. So this is in map plot. So what we're able to do is we're, we're able to load our wells. We then can um, focus on our pay classes. I've just here selected pay class one and two as, a, as our filter. We then put the elevation as measured depth. So this will give us the this will give us the mean measured depth of those two pay classes. And then our color scale is uh, porosity, the mean porosity. So this is for the dry well data set uh, provided by the uh, the OGA, which is 514 wells. And you can see that um, a lot of these dry wells do contain pay to a certain extent. The next approach to classifying pay is using the reservoir evalu evaluation tool. This reservoir evaluation tool was made specifically um, for this project. And you have the ability with this uh, reservoir evaluation tool to get a whole range of attributes. For example, net reservoir, um, reservoir net to gross, reservoir mean porosity, net pay, uh, pay net to gross, pay means uh, water saturation, and pay mean porosity. And basically these are all the parameters that you need, that the geologists need for their reserve calculations. <clears throat> this will be, uh, this, this pay classification, or the, so the, the uh, reservoir evaluation tool will be demoed later on. <clears throat> So in the reservoir evaluation tool, we are able to load our well set. We can select our filter by a formation. In the reservoir evaluation tool, we can load our mean, our mean porosity and our mean water saturation curves. We can apply customized cutoffs. In this case, I've taken 0.1% uh, porosity and 0.6% on the water saturation. Elevation is net reservoir and the color coding is net pay and this is all for the ETIF formation and you can see there that we do have indications of missed pay. Our sample set here is the dry well data set <clears throat> and if we flick through other formations we see the Ness formation and we have the Kimmeridge clay formation and we could have done other formations as well the Cretaceous and the the, uh, the Paleocene sands as well. So now the proof of the eating is always in the results. And uh, so what we have, I'm going to give you a few examples of missed pay. This one is in uh, quadrant 211, well 211, 11, one well. We have a lithology prediction. The blue line is the porosity prediction. The red is the water saturation. We have a pay zones and I put on a caliper flag. And you can see that we have pay in the Tarbert, Etiv, and Rannoch formations. But also, what's interesting for me is the backstory that goes on for this because nobody really intentionally misses pay. So it's interesting for me that this well was drilled in 74. This was three years after the, the Brent discovery. In this block, there were 13 other discoveries made before this well was drilled. So a lot of big discoveries were made before this well was drilled. Um, the final well report, there was no detailed fi final well report, there was no completion log and there was no hydrocarbon shows descriptions here. So you can see that maybe the reason for this mispay is that they hadn't discovered a large pay zone. So therefore they said, okay, we're gonna move on to the next middle Jurassic rotator fault block and let's find that. Uh, that that big field. Um, who knows? You can only you can only um, uh, guess on that type of thing. But I think there's always a bit of a, a backstory behind these mispay examples. 
Another example I, I, I looked, another area I looked at was the Brent field. So what I've done here is I've plotted all the PESO, pay, pay classes, pay class two, three, and four in the Brent field. This is including exploration wells and development wells. And you can see clearly the, the regional oil water contact in the Statfield formation. But also what you see is three wells showing us some missed pay at deeper levels. I'll just say all this is plotted in TVD sub C. So if we then look at those wells in detail, we see the, uh, the 29, dash A17 well, we can see distinctly the oil water contact that we're predicting in the, um, in the Statfjord, uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the Brent formation. You then go deeper down and we have, we have uh, decreases in the water saturation and we have, we have some, uh, some increase in the porosity. We can say, is this, mis is this mispay? We go deep into the Cormorant formation and we have two distinct um, intervals there where we have an increase in porosity and a decrease in the water saturation. <clears throat> and this, this well lies directly under the Brent field. Then of course we have the two wells which lie to the east of the discovery, the 29.5 and the 29.9 well. These, uh, these wells show a decrease of water saturation uh, in the Kimmeridge clay, is in the 29.5 well, and also in the Cormorant formation here, we have our indications of pay. In the 29.9 well, we have indications of pay in the Kimmeridge clay formation. So you can see in mature areas, we are able to find potential pay candidates, or we find pay candidates under existing fields. The next example I want to show is the Cara discovery example. This is from the, from the Norwegian Continental Shelf. Um, initially, the 36.7 well, 7.3 well, was drilled in 2001 when the oil price was low. Um, the well was reported dry. There was no shows registered. Um, uh, LWD data was the only uh, log data collected, but later work by Tullo suggested that there was potentially a few meters pay within Cretaceous sands. And their thinking was that, um, that the 7.3 well had drilled the tail end of a much larger discovery. So if we look at this well in our project, we do see two pay zones within the Cretaceous sand, two thin pay zones in, in, the, in the Cretaceous sands. Our prediction of water saturation shows decrease in water saturation and the porosity shows an increase in porosity there. Um, and, our, um, yeah, and our caliper flag shows that we have a good hole all the way through. So this is a really interesting example where you have very thin, um, pay zones which leads to a larger discovery and I think uh, the press release says there was uh, 158 to 198 million barrels in place for this uh, discovery. So now about pay ranking, um, how do we go about pay ranking here? So what I've done is I've basically taken that pay thickness, you know, maybe if you want to go and start hunting for some of these um, missed pay opportunity, you want to go for the big thick um, missed pay opportunities. So of course I've got pay thickness versus counts and we see there's a, uh, a lot of counts within zero to two meters and it tails off quickly when you, when you go from two meters to for example 12 meters and then of course to 50 meters. But of course we know from the car example is just a, you know, a, a three or four meter pay interval can yield you quite a lot of oil. But also from the, the, the very first example I showed you from the uh, 211 16B7 well where we had a, a 50 meter column, um, that can also be interesting as well. So what I've also done here is I've probably plotted pay interval thickness versus average water saturation. So in every pay interval thickness, in every pay interval, we are in this, in this project, we're able to calculate a, an average water saturation, also an average porosity. 
and I've plotted on the examples um, that I've showed you today. So really, we think there is no unique solution to pay ranking here. Um, but I think what we do is we provide a tool for geologists to dig deeper into the data so they have the ability to go and explore those opportunities themselves. Um, and I think with that, I, I, uh, I will pass over to Bezal, my colleague, for a, a demo. <clears throat> Thank you, Daniel. So now we move into a uh, short demo of uh, uh, EarthNet and see some of these uh, things that uh, Daniel has uh, shown live in EarthNet. We start first with our Earth Bank, which is where we get access to uh, uh, this large amount of structured data. So here I can start by adding some cultural data and uh, this can be also done uh, with uh, for different uh, users uh, in this case i'm adding just field and quadrants from uh, both sides and uh, you can uh, see that uh, the next thing is the project so I just click on our master project which uh, i i get uh, I think it's uh, internet, give me two seconds. So the well is, uh, the project is here now. And again, I add uh, the layers, the uh, fields, structure elements. Then we go to uh, UK layers. So what I also added here for uh, uh, some more information from UK, so we can see that we have added the outline of different reservoirs published by uh, OGA, and this can be expanded further to different uh, reservoirs. We also add different well sets. We have shows, wells with hydrocarbon, dry wells, and also geological elements like faults and different uh, structural uh, uh, information. So uh, if I uh, uh, zoom in also into the uh, project, we can also see uh, the wells. So these are the wells in the project, 4,824. So the next thing I would like to show is when we have access to this 5,000 wells, we need to do some QC. And here, this is the semi-automated uh, QC that uh, Daniel mentioned. I have selected one well here as a test. We can add as many wells as we want. And then I have selected gamma ray, sonic, density, and neutron. Then those QC elements we can apply here. The first thing is the physical range. So for gamma ray, I put zero to 1000. Also for density, the relevant values and sonic and neutron. We can also get rid of the linear interpolated lines. We can also get the understanding of where are the spikes to really uh, control them or flag them. So here you see this dashed lines shows the physical range that I have applied. And uh, if I just click on this uh, DT here, so you see that the DT had in this log, in this well, quite a lot of uh, values that are not physically possible. And that's just uh, by this clicking test and save here, I will do this automatic correction for uh, 5,000 wells. And we have also a statistic of how many depth points we had, negative numbers for sonic, for gamma ray, for all logs. The next thing is that when we have the QC, and as also Daniel mentioned, we always keep the original data for reference. This is where we create uh, wellbore QC flag. We have three different sources to create a uh, wellbore QC flag, caliper minus bit size, and if bit size is not available, we estimate the bit size using caliper. And the third thing is density correction. So here, this is a well from quadrant 15 in the Norwegian continental shelf. And the panel to the right shows the bit size. The middle one shows the caliper. And here I am selecting two inches difference as, more, as my QC uh, criteria. We can change this into different numbers. We can also put a percentage instead of using an absolute value, we can go into a ratio. 
So when this is done, just to show you some examples of uh, the QC data, this is a multiple cross plot or a matrix cross plot of gamma ray dens sonic density for the UK quadrant 210 wells. So this is before QC, and this is after the major steps of QC. But then there are still values that are within the physical range. It means that we have bad whole uh, QCs. And then that is the next slide here. And these are not slides, actually. These are actual data. So you can actually save them into a kind of slider story and present it in the meeting. So this is the final data ready for machine learning. And uh, in machine learning, I can just uh, briefly show you the machine learning application in ArthNet allow us to select wells, filter them by stratigraphy, filter them by interval data like lithology, hydrocarbon column, or uh, DST intervals, and then select the features that we are going to train our target, in this case, porosity, with those features. Then we have loads of uh, algorithms available to us, all the algorithms with the preferred one and with the uh, the, the nice last thing in the machine learning is that this is a cloud-based software and here we can just select whatever uh, worker we want depending on the availability we have access we are we can use Amazon we can use Google uh, uh, Microsoft and also if there are companies that want to use their local uh, uh, kind of uh, servers to do the calculation so from here we move into uh, the um, um, the data visualization. So we have seen uh, how we QC the data on the Earth Bank. This is where uh, the application in ArthNet, which is called Earth Insight. And uh, in Earth Insight, we can do all these data visualizations. The first thing I can add actually is I can add some layers here. Let's bring in the fields uh, and uh, the um, uh, You've actually stopped sharing your screen. Okay. You want to reshare it again? Yes. Uh, am I sharing now? Yeah. Yeah. So um, here we are in Earth Insight. So we just add some uh, layers like uh, we did this in Earth Bank. I add some layers from uh, Norway and some layers from the UK side. Uh, then we start with uh, uh, selecting the wells. So here, the possibility of selecting wells in uh, EarthNet is you can select everything or you can actually select well sets. So in this project, you see that we have loads of different well sets based on different quadrants. So for example, this UK dry is the wellbore content classified as dry hole in the uh, shape files of the OGA. And uh, here I am going to select UK quadrant 16. And from UK quadrant 16, I'm going to select all wells. Then we can filter on a stratigraphy. So I will select some formations there. So you see that the red uh, circles appear on the map is the selected wells, which are quadrant 16 of UK. Here, I just uh, select uh, uh, the um, reservoir that I want to uh, have visualization on. So here I select this uh, Britannia sand. And then here again, the next filter will be the intervals. Daniel showed the pay classes that has been identified in this project. So I can just show three pay classes that identified. Now I can also filter it with the QC filter that I have already created in the project, which means the scalifer minus bit size. So these are the filters that we have selected. And uh, actually we go into the map plot and the map plot I can say, let's look into the mean porosity colored by measured depth for all the wells in this quadrant that has 
this particular formation that I have selected. And when the data comes in, we will get the average uh, of these two properties that we selected, which means that the average of MD for that uh, a particular selection and the average uh, porosity. So the data is always available here, but the display here shows now. So the height of the bars shows the porosity, the mean porosity in that uh, two formations that I've selected, and the color shows the depth of them, the average depth to those MD to those uh, uh, formations. So what I can do now, I can go back into my filter options and change this pay classes because now we are looking into the three pay classes that Daniel created in the project. So instead of using into pay classes, we say, just look into the predicted lithology for this project, which is four classes all over 5,000 wells that had this uh, different imputation data. And then I can just update that. So this time, instead of looking into those four classes, I'm looking into the average of these two porosity and depth only where in these two formations we have sands. And that is visualized. But now the next thing which is actually quite interesting and that's what can help us to do this um, uh, ranking is this reservoir evaluation. So now here we have the possibility to select based on the filters that I applied, formations and sandstone, I select the porosity and final saturation. And I can give here, let's say, every water saturation less than 60%. And these are the range of attributes that are available for A, visualization, B, exporting in table format. So we will have the possibility to look into every of these data elements here, both here in the visualization and also exporting. So I will look into the net reservoir in uh, thickness and also net pay. So if I update this, then I will have this information available. And now I not only have map plot, but also reservoir evaluation. So if I click on this I here, then I will, if I click here on the map plot, I will have the map plot. If I click on the reservoir evaluation, I will have the reservoir evaluation. So in the reservoir evaluation now, we see Britannia formation in quadrant 16 UK. So we see that the net reservoir is between 26 and 152 meter, and the net pay is here. So let's look into uh, pays from 40 to 88 meters. And this is live changed here. Now, the uh, thing that is, interesting here to apply, which uh, will be uh, things for, uh, for, of course, further work is, if we, to just to save the time, is we can actually select UK dry wells. There are 500 and something of those 1,700 dry wells in UK within this project. So if I select this UK dry well, then I can select different formations and I can run this tool to show me the pay with the cutoff that is required with the different, uh, of course, companies' uh, um, petrophysical culture, then I will map directly the miss pays on this particular formation that we select. So the last thing I would like to show is uh, just uh, to see if we map these things, we get these identified, uh, unidentified or previously overlooked uh, pays, we can actually start putting them into the context of 3D. So here, I just show one example from Sleipner that we have this predicted uh, porosity on the uh, well log and the background is seismic. And as Eric mentioned, we can go to 3D porosity, 3D lithology and 3D saturation, which is further maturation of the overlooked uh, page that is already identified in the project. And with this, I leave to this last slide of uh, Daniel's presentation, which is, I guess here, yes. Yeah, thank you, Basad. Um, so really that, that, that really concludes um, our presentation and our demo. Um, 
in terms of a you know a, a way forward is um, because uh, we would like to work uh, work closely with the corresponding operators and stakeholders to kind of really quantify the findings that we've uh, that we've got. Um, we would like to we propose to extend the study to other areas, um, and also uh, predict reservoir properties in three D, i.e., moving from well to seismic. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, an absolute that was an excellent presentation, and um, I'd just like to say to everyone, I mean, these these results really are sort of hot off the press as it were, you know, these, um, I guess these sort of projects have been going right up until, um, you know, the last week or two, you know, for right up before these events. So I think uh, absolutely excellent job done by um, the science analytics there. Um, we've overrun slightly, so I, I want to just sort of, we might not have time for all, all the questions, but we will try our best. I think we can give you a couple of extra minutes as we did start a little bit late. Um, just going back through, there's quite a few. Um, I'd like to say that if your question, if we don't get around to answering your question now, we will take a note of it and um, hopefully manage to answer it after the session. So, okay, let's see what have we got here. Um, so we've got one here, first one. In your feature engine, do you differ between different acquisition models, LWD versus uh, wireline, different types of tools, e.g. thermal versus epithermal neutron logs, OBM versus uh, WBM MUDs, etc. If you'd like to unmute yourselves. Yeah, um, well thank you for the question. Um, I think the short answer is no we don't. Uh, we don't differentiate um, uh, between the different log types, for example, or the different mud types used. Um, basically, what we've been doing is, of course, we've got the data from data cone. We've been taking that at face value, and we've uh, we've worked with it. Um, I can add that actually, when we have this scale of uh, the um, the data available to us. It's very easy to find the outliers. So we look into, we do the uh, log characteristics per formation. So if there are any uh, changes in the ranges for the similar formations that has to be the same, it is uh, easily uh, identifiable. Okay, uh, moving on then to a uh, bit on the data QC here. Um, can you please say a little bit more about when you mentioned sort of remove non-physical values sort of so so what criteria do you use uh, do you check Poisson's ratio for sonic logs etc yeah, yeah. non-physical values actually are values that uh, no matter where you go they are every, there is a unanimous agreement on this so we all agree that there is no negative porosity so if you see in the example I show, I had minus two for neutron because there are sometimes limestones that can go to minus one or minus one point something. So for us, in order to do that, we have done two approaches, looked into the literature and also talked to different petrophysicists in different companies to make sure that what we are applying, we are not removing data, which is possible for that particular property. So we know that it is impossible to get 8,000 meter per second VP in any sedimentary rocks. But still that is, uh, so, so this is uh, the criteria for us to, and there is no negative gamma ray, for example. So the non-physical values has been applied in this way. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, next one here, to predict well log curves, how do you handle different well lengths? What is the frequency of predictions in terms of measured depth? Yeah, I, I... Dimitris, can you uh, comment on this question? Sure. Uh, yes, so in all our models, because we handle on, on this large scale of data, we avoid using MD as an input feature. So MD is actually excluded formations are uh, declining, depths are different for the same reservoir 
in different areas can be a different uh, TVD. So MD has not been used. Also has not been used for two reasons. One, because of the reason I explained before that uh, we have declines of the, of the formations, different depths at different areas. But also when we check our models, we have seen that the feature importance of MD in predicting either porosity of saturation was minimal, actually contributing slightly on the uh, global uh, model performance. So we thought MD is not of, of interest. So none of the models we have used has, has, has used MD or TVD as input feature. I can also add that uh, the dominant in depth index uh, or depth sampling we had is uh, about 15 centimeters. We had some wells with uh, uh, seven centimeters. Uh, of course, in the QC, we had problems with wells that had actually one millimeter depth indexing. We had to click, uh, remove them from the data. Sorry about that. I have a budding young geoscientist on the call here. I just got, obviously got very excited there about <laughs> that answer. Uh, um, there's this, this is a question about, um, I guess, the sort of data types here. So it's a, there was um, mentioned that there were 90 data types used to build the model. Um, again, they're asking sort of, what are those data types? Um, I guess, well, were they, were they consistent across all 3,000 wells? Or how did you select the data types to build the model? I mean, the data types that we selected um, were, you know, predominantly the, uh, the gamma ray, uh, DT, density, uh, uh, neutron, and resistivity logs. Um, other data types we use, of course, is um, uh, core uh, porosity measurements. Um, and, you know, other data types that we use that were kind of auxiliary was, you know, we have, you know, we have um, put in DST information in here. Um, we have oil shows information, um, it's uh, uh, gross column information, all this, all this information is part of the data types that we use. So there's a lot of auxiliary data types which add value to our models and basically are used to calibrate them and make sure we're honest with our, with our observations. Okay, thank you. Right, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, stop the question there because I think we, you know, we, we need we need to move on now to to keep to keep the time and to get to the next presentation. Um, like I say, we will make a note of the questions that we haven't been able to ask and pass them on to um, the team at Earth Science so they can get back to you with those. So again, well, so once again, thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, Eric, and Bazard there for, for, for an absolutely excellent uh, presentation. Okay, so um, we're now gonna move on now to say, to hear from Merkel Aquila. So again, there's a lot of emphasis, they, they are sort of, I think, you know, they approach this from a different angle as they are sort of not predominantly, a, they, they are not an oil and gas based company. So, you know, I think it's fair to say they were on a rapid learning curve with this. And I think, you know, I'm sure Stephen will, um, Say thank you to the support that Total has given them throughout this, and I'd like to, you know, second that as well. So, um, without taking any more time up, I'd like to hand you over to Stephen from Merkel Aquila, who will um, detail their approach to this challenge. All yours. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, as Ian said. Uh, my name is Steve Sinclair. I'm from Merkel Aquila. Hopefully my screen share should be coming up. Um, yeah, so definitely thank you to the OGTC for giving us the opportunity to work on this really interesting project. Uh, as you said, we're not necessarily uh, oil and gas experts, but we, we do work in the, the data space across a number of different industries. So um, there was definitely a learning curve here, but it was super interesting and um, really fascinating. Uh, particular thank you to Total to for providing their, their expertise on this project. Um, lots of really interesting conversations, lots of really useful conversations, uh, and that was incredibly valuable. Uh, equally, 
Um, thank you to the operators for supplying the data and thank you to SORD as well for uh, producing that wonderful uh, condition data set, which I'll uh, talk more on. Um, so yeah, so I said I'm a senior data science manager from Merkel Aquila. Um, you probably haven't heard from us before. Um, we, we were established in 2012 as uh, Aquila Insights based in Edinburgh. Uh, acquired a few years ago by a company called Merkel, based in the US, who employ over 2,000 data scientists and engineers globally. Um, Aquila, though, form the basis of, of that function uh, within the UK and within Europe. Um, we have uh, 130, 130 analysts, data scientists, data engineers, uh, predominantly based in Edinburgh and London. Uh, we've got a few in Derby, Bristol, uh, and we've got a little help at, up in Aberdeen to, um, to help out our our oil and gas clients. Um, and I think was what was mentioned previously, we're all about driving value from our analytical solutions. We're, we're very much commercially orientated company, uh, not academic. Um, and, and that really comes through in how we work and, and the pace in which we work. Um, we're very much value first rather than data first. Um, is, is kind of how we talk. Uh, we work across a number of different areas for a number of different clients, um, everything from optimizing um, cloud stacks, um, technology stacks, um, Internet of Things, to data science, AI, uh, building BI tools, um, and all the way to, to things like um, building up analytics teams within companies and, and doing in-housing. In, in and we do that through um, our, our, our teams, our people, uh, who a, a team would comprise of a data translator, maybe some data engineers and some data scientists or analysts, uh, and all, all projects will, will, will have that kind of mix. Um, for this project, uh, and for many projects, as I said, um, we kind of class our, our, our data people in kind of three different ways. We have data translators, data scientists, and data engineers. Uh, that's me in the middle there, uh, looking uh, a wee bit younger than I do today. Um, I'm a data scientist, so I'm all about using scientific methods, uh, extracting knowledge and insights from, from data, um, understanding what the business needs and how to translate that into a, a data science project. Uh, I'm supported closely by our data engineers, so that's uh, Simone on the right-hand side. Um, absolutely instrumental in putting together a tech stack for me to, to make sure I can complete a project, minimizing over, over uh, IT overheads, uh, and helping me deploy tools into the cloud. Uh, for example, and getting all that whole data flow working, uh, and that, that really helps me speed up um, the delivery of projects. Uh, and on the left, uh, we've got Lucy, uh, who is our data translator from this project, uh, kind of like a project manager, but does a little bit more, um, particularly around making sure that I'm producing value on projects, making sure that I uh, stick to the brief uh, and I always got the, the, the client's needs in, in, in mind. So she basically keeps me honest and keeps me on track. Um, as Ian said, we're kind of new to oil and gas, um, but we've done, we have done a few projects, uh, particularly around automated reporting, dashboards, visualization, things like that. Uh, a few projects around uh, asset integrity management. So building machine learning models, for example, to predict when uh, particular uh, bits of machinery might fail. Uh, that's often linked actually to the, the automated reporting elements. Um, and things, some quite advanced things actually around uh, human augmentation uh, and automation, uh, IoT, AI for robotics. So building vision, si vision systems for robotics, for example, that's super interesting. Um, I think it's fair to say we've not done so much on the subsurface side, although we've, we've done a little bit around core visualization and uh, organizing data. Uh, organizing data for core samples. So, but this project probably represents the certainly the longest running and probably most in-depth project around um, uh, subsurface work. Uh, so, from that point of view, it's uh, it's been really interesting. Um, we all know about the business challenge. We've heard about it a few times now. Um, our view on this was really to really take a data-led approach rather than a um, uh, like a, a data science approach rather than a, a geoscience approach. Um, so we're here to identify pay and 
and hopefully missed pay, uh, as we've talked, uh, as has been mentioned a few times. Our solution to this, our approach to this kind of revolves around three complementary techniques uh, that we've, we've put together. Uh, the first technique follows a uh, kind of established method, kind of more analogous to what a, a human expert might do to, to directly predict pay intervals. The, the second technique um, kind of correlates with, with that first technique and, and takes a, a kind of an entirely unbiased view. The, the idea of bias is um, it's kind of rife in this project. It's, it's, it's something one needs to to pay careful attention to. Um, and then the third technique is, is, was kind of born out of necessity actually to, to visualize as much of the data as we possibly could to help us understand and validate what we were doing. And it actually became, became the core of, of, of what we did. Um, so the outcome of this, we develop a data-driven approach to analyze something like 150 million data points from around 3,000 wells, and to be able to do that all in one place, uh, we feel is, uh, is is pretty cool. So today, talking about pay prediction, we'll I'll go into a little bit, quite a bit of depth actually about our approach uh, and how we bring those models together. Um, I'll then take a slight aside and kind of talk about the, this little visualization tool that we put together um, very quickly, really. Uh, to help us in our work and kind of show you how we were using that. Um, and then go into a bit more depth again about how it is we interpret our results in predicting pay. So yeah, as I said, our approach, very much a data different approach um, for doing well log analysis. A lot of time spent on whiteboards um, and my, my, my team will probably roll their eyes at that point because they had to listen to me uh, many times. Uh, the development flow. For this project kind of follows any data science project. Um, they all follow a, a very similar pattern and this one was no different really. Um, we start off by exploring and understanding the data once it's received. We, um, we then build features off that raw data. We very rarely put raw data into a machine learning model. Uh, one will usually spend some time generating targets and features to pass into that model. And the modeling part itself is actually uh, relatively short, um, but is also the most fun part. And then we spend a good chunk of time analyzing the output from those models and checking that it, that it makes sense um, before going on to generate the deliverables for the clients. Um, uh, there's also a lot of iteration that goes in there, a lot of tweaking and understanding and going back and forth. But generally speaking, this is, this is what um, a development flow will, will actually look like. Um, so understanding the data, the data supplied and what is useful are very different. So uh, SORT were very kind and gave us a look of the, the actual raw data that they received. Um, that was frightening, shall we say. And I think Certainly anyone who doesn't have experience with that kind of data would have struggled to do much with it. I think even the operators um, would struggle to handle that volume of data in that condition. So the work they did was actually, was absolutely instrumental in enabling us uh, to make progress with this project. Uh, having said that, so we received about 60,000 files. Um, we ended up using about 5,000. Uh, the main reason for that is a lot of the data is just, we just consider it out of scope. There's a lot of um, um, image files and things like that, documentation, um, which we decided not to use. So the, the majority of what we used was the process last files and the digitized uh, CPI logs. Um, and we, a few of those were dropped off just because of uh, data quality issues, things like that. So some of the, CPI logs, for example, had uh, negative values and things like that. So, um, of course, we, we decided just not to use those. Um, however, a couple of other interesting points with the data. Uh, no target information. So if you're familiar with data science, uh, a target is really useful. So in this case, the target would be a uh, pay zone or net pay, uh, if you prefer. Um, that didn't really exist in the data. Um, and if we have no knowledge of pay, we have no knowledge of potential mispay. So that gives us a, a few different issues from a, a data science point of view. Uh, 
one of the biggest being we don't really have a metric to track. It's going to be really difficult to say we achieve 85% accuracy and this is how we improve on that. So um, that's, that makes life quite, quite difficult. Uh, so validating your results is actually quite difficult as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk as to a few different ways to how we approach that. Um, so thinking about the solution uh, and how we approach this, this problem. Um, so if we want to identify pay, we really want a few of the following things. We want that identifiable target that, that allows us to make models that, that say this is pay and this is not pay. And that's, that's something that's uh, kind of preferable to us. We want low bias, that's bias in terms of uh, the human input. Uh, people have biases. Um, we want to avoid that. Equally, there we note there is potential for bias within the data itself and, and how it's collected. Uh, and I'll I'll talk to that as well. But again, that's for any data science project, that's that's something to be aware of. Um, and by avoiding that bias, we want to allow for that identifying novel pay zones. Again, that's that's kind of talking to the the missed pay side of this this project. Uh, and we want to apply this to as much of the data as possible. It would be easy just to focus on a single field, for example, but of course that's that's kind of not what we're trying to do. We're trying to do things at scale. Now, as I said, we received a much better data set than um, what the original raw data set looked like, which is fantastic, but um, I've never received a data set which is machine learning ready there's always something you need to do to it and that's that's just pretty common and i think the the last presentation did a really good job of explaining some of the issues um, around that so um i i wholeheartedly agree with that approach you know there's things around depths uh which need to be corrected um not every well was on the same depth basis so you know it's it's very useful for them all to be on the same death basis. Um, so we need to correct for that. Uh, there's still even a little bit of consolidation around some of the mnemonics. So for example, gamma ray might be labeled as you know one and two. So we need to try and pick what, what to use or how, certainly how to handle that. Because again, machine learning models like consistency. Um, and where we don't have consistency, we, we need to do something about it. Uh, and then things like outlier removals and you know the, the usual uh, things you might see in pre-processing steps. Uh, I think like, everybody doing the analytics we also built models to impute density uh, neutron this seems to be um uh, seemed to be a pop a popular approach so uh, again that's quite good because that validates what what we've done um the reason for doing that is we had this concept of coverage across the data uh you need consistency in a model so you need a data point across the the same depth uh, measurements. So you, we used gamma rays, sonic logs, deep resistivity, and then neutron and density in all our modeling. Um, but you need a data point across each of those features. Um, otherwise, machine, lo machine learning models tend to not be very happy. But if you include density and neutron, uh, it tends to restrict the depth interval that you, you have that consistency across. Uh, uh, that's kind of problematic because um, it would be easy to do, but it introduces that bias I was talking about. It means that we're only really looking for pay in the intervals that we're kind of already sure there's pay anyway. Um, so that would actually be a little bit easy. So we use additional models, uh, again, based on neural nets to impute that data to a, a much larger extent of the, um, the well depth column. Uh, and as was mentioned previously, so um, we perform feature engineering. Uh, applied machine learning is basically feature engineering. Um, you can have the fanciest model in the world, but if you have rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So uh, I think pretty much all the talks have mentioned that one. Uh, so the features were things like, you know, rolling median standard deviations from our input variables, uh, taking the difference from that rolling uh, mean or median uh, to the raw data. Um, that has the effect of, you know, detrending the data, which is um, something that's really important. Uh, and then again, target engineering. So as I said, we don't really have that concept of pay, but we can derive it from uh, from the CPI logs by applying cutoff to that data. So again, that's just uh, a few of the steps that, that you need to take before you can actually go ahead and do any modeling. 
Um, it became quite clear, and I think, again, interesting similarities to the previous project. Single model doesn't really do everything we want it to do. Um, so quite early on, we had this idea that you need more than one model to address the problem. Um, so as I said, you know, we wanted to predict pay intervals. Uh, we want to be able to remove bias from the process. We wanted to be able to make novel predictions. Um, and we, we wanted to be able to apply the result to the whole data set uh, or as much of the data set as we possibly could. Um, so there's kind of two classes of modeling. Uh, which you may be familiar with, there's target-based modeling and non-target-based modeling. So for the data scientists in the audience today, that's supervised modeling and unsupervised modeling. Um, so for that target-based or supervised modeling, um, yeah, you can predict pay intervals, so you can create a target variable from the CPI logs. Um, but we only really had about 200 CPI logs uh, that we could really use after various quality checks. So we note that there's kind of a potential for bias when you're doing that. Um, you're sort of looking in sort of common depth intervals, uh, perhaps in the sort of similar sets of fields. So um, you can do that, but it mean, and that's fine, but we, you just have to have that, that, that thing in the back of your head that says, just, just be careful when using that. And so it's not clear then whether you can make novel predictions at, at depths, at other depths. Um, when you use that data, but you can apply it to the whole data set. So of course, that's, that, that's a good thing. Um, Non-target based models, so, um, so unsupervised modeling. So they don't make direct predictions. That's not what they're, they're used for. Um, but you can make them effectively completely unbiased. So that does allow for that uh, making novel or pre novel predictions or um, looking for mispay. Uh, and again, you can apply it to the whole data set. So um, it was pretty clear to us early on that actually more than one model modeling approach is going to be needed. So we actually came up with three different models um, to do this project. Uh, the idea of bringing, giving us predictions and some context, allowing for novelty and allowing us to compare across the whole data set was, was kind of the, the, the things we really wanted to get out of this project. Uh, the first model all being about predictions, so making a direct prediction using that CPI data. Uh, we actually follow a semi-supervised approach there. Um, um, if, I won't dwell on that too much, but that really just allows us to make the, the maximum use of that quite limited CPI data. Um, so we, we create the target variable, which is pay, uh, derived from the CPI logs by using a set of cutoffs. Um, um, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a sec. Uh, second model was around clustering. So we use a kind of a data-driven unbiased approach to effectively try to simulate rock types without really having that information in the data itself. Let's start thinking about lithology and clustering each, each well on a well by well basis. Uh, it's a bit more generalized, so this can be applied to a lot more of the data than, than when we use the CPI data. Um, again, we're, we're using neural nets here, so that's allowing for nonlinear features to be generated. Um, so that's that that's looking at you know those those deep interactions those things that like a human might might not be able to do, um, and then the third model was effectively a dimensionality reduction technique uh, again using neural nets. Um, this was born out of the frustration of not being able to compare our results from the first two models uh, across all the data sets. Um, it's kind of difficult to look at a whole stack of wells and you know as soon as you get above ten or so. It's kind of tricky, and then when you start getting to hundreds or thousands, it's, it's basically impossible. So um, we wanted a way to look at as much of the data as we possibly could uh, in a single plot, and uh, that's what we went ahead and did. And uh, just just a little note, um, as, as there's no definitive indicators for pay zones, and certainly not for the whole data set, there's no overall metric for assessing the performance of this project. So. Um, that's kind of frustrating from a data science point of view uh, and, and a little bit limiting. So we, we lean very heavily at this point on uh, the expertise uh, that was uh, provided to us in the project. And uh, again, uh, we're, we're, we're very, very thankful for that. 
Uh, right, so talking about the first model. Um, uh, as I said, this model is all about doing predictions. It's a semi-supervised approach, um, very similar to a supervised approach, but it's just the way you label back the data and retrain models. Um, that's, that's the only real difference. Uh, we use this to predict, to sort of directly predict net pay zones in the data based on, on, on the well logs. So the input data is the well log curves or rather the features derived from them. So uh, gamma ray, sonic, deep recessivity, uh, density of neutron. And then we derive a target from the CPI logs and that's get fed into neural nets. So this is not really special about neural nets. Um, it's just a simple dense neural net. Um, I think there's, there's only you know two or three, uh, I think there's only like two hidden layers there. Um, and then the output is a logistic a activation. Uh, for those in the audience, I think there's this, some people are uh, more knowledgeable about this, uh, but all that does is gives us a zero one output and it looks something like this. So in the orange, that's where we've defined net pay using a set of cutoffs um, and the blue is where it's predicted now. It's pretty common for this, this kind of data set where we've got a limited number of true positive. So we've got a lot less net pay than we have not net pay. Um, so that's what we call an imbalanced data set. Um, and it's pretty common um, in places like fraud analytics and banking, for example. Um, so y you have to be a little careful um, in those circumstances. It tends to lead a lot to lead to a lot of false positives in your result. It's effectively what happens. Um, so one needs to be a little careful. Uh, I've put the accuracy down there for this model. This is the one model I, I could put a, a number against. Uh, it's around about 96%, which sounds really good, but because of that imbalance, you need to be a little careful of that number. Um, for those who are aware of the, uh, the F1 score here, was like around about 0.7, which is actually uh, not too bad, but um, you're very aware that the, the data going into this model was perhaps not fully representative um, for for the whole data set, just because, just because of that, um, uh, the number of, of, of samples uh, or curves we actually had. The second model was about clustering. So this is an unsupervised approach. Uh, we use an autoencoder, which is a particular structure of neural nets. Um, I'll go into a little bit of detail about this. There's a lot, I could talk all day about this. My, my team will tell you, I could talk all day about autoencoders. Um, I think they're incredibly useful. Um, so if you do want to talk more about them, please do get in touch. Um, but the idea behind it is to try and understand and group interesting features um, of a well log. The input here is just the well log curves or the features that are built um, from the well log curves. They get fed into a network that looks a bit like this. And uh, what we get out is basically what we put in or as close to as. Now that sounds like a really weird thing to do. Why bother putting in data into a network just to get out what I put in? So there are two interesting things here. The data gets fed in, it gets compressed down to that bottleneck in the middle, and then it gets expanded back out. Um, and the idea being is the network learns what a well log looks like in general. So that's kind of interesting. So I put a new well log into that. I can subtract the input from the output. And where there are large differences, it's effectively an outlier detection tool. So the, the hypothesis here being that where there are large differences, those are interesting features that are not commonly found. Net pay should not be not commonly found in, in, uh, across the whole of a well log. Um, so that should flag it up. That did not work. <laughs> that was our initial hypothesis. Uh, it turns out that uh, when you use like 1D convolutional layers in your uh, autoencoder, it actually learns the structure of a well really, really well. So actually the difference between the output and the input wasn't that big and it wasn't consistent at flagging interesting things. Um, so that was a little bit of a downer, um, but the, you get something else out of autoencoder. You can actually, once you pass in a new set of data, you can actually pull the data uh, or from that bottleneck. And effectively what you've got is a dimensionality reduction tool um, it's kind of similar to what we're going to do in the next page, but if you do it on a well by well basis, you can actually cluster up what you get out of that bottleneck. You can plot it, cluster it, and apply it back to your well log. Uh, and you've got 
effectively uh, a sense of the lithology, uh, hopefully. Um, now, we didn't really have enough information to definitively say that that's what was going, but it was useful in trying to identify pay. Um, that's really interesting. Um, for those of you who want to take some notes, so we extended this to what's called deep embedded clustering. So that's even a more advanced technique where we train the autoencoder to understand what a model is, and then we retrain um, the clustering part to, to really get those tight clusters. So that little plot of points and clusters you see there is, is a real result. So we can get very, very clean clusters out. Um, so it's, it's a very, very powerful technique. Uh, it's really interesting, but I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about it here. Um, third technique is kind of another dimensionality reduction, but it's, it's, it's more sort of cleanly dimensionality reduction. Uh, again, it's another autoencoder, but rather than taking in each row of the while log, we actually feed in little intervals. Um, in our example here, we're feeding in 80 meter while log intervals. Um, that number can be changed. We use 80 meters simply because it looks quite nice on a plot um, and makes life, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, so sorry, can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay. Um, so we can plot all it. It's, it's similar to the last one, but we can plot out the two-dimensional plot. Uh, and we can take that 80 meter interval and plot it as a single point in two dimensions. And uh, we can do this across the whole data set. So effectively what we do is we take the 150 million data points, we can compress it down to about 50,000 data points um, and we can view them all together. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna spend a good bit of time talking about what that actually means. Um, so that really brings us again, it, it, interesting that uh, the previous talk mentioned this. So we're, we're now talking about well logs as a, as a big data problem. Um, so so we, got, we, we ended up using about 3000 well logs um, for this, which is around about 150 million data points. Uh, standard approach, you get an expert to look at the data. They might look at an individual well log they have to analyze. Um, it's you know, about a tenth of 1% of the data. Previous experience is you know, a handful of fields, so maybe maybe a few percent of the data they create predictions. That that's that's all good, that's all fine, that's a robust way of going about that. They can't immediately apply that knowledge back to all 3,000 wells, though. that's a bit of a limitation. Um, and in general, it's kind of hard to compare across large numbers of wells. Um, then we take a supervised or semi-supervised approach, again, using the CPI logs, that gives us again a few percent of the data. Um, we can put that into a neural network and we can again identify some, some pay zones, but we can apply that back to the whole data set. So again, uh, the power of machine learning there means we can do things at scale. Um, but we know that there may be bias in there. It may not be representative of all the data. Uh, oops, that skipped forward, interestingly. Um, which brings us to the unsupervised approaches. So. The idea is to remove that bias that, that may be present in those first two approaches. Um, we can apply it to the whole data set, though, which is which is really nice. Uh, we can use that that first autoencoder, that's that clustering model, to, to group the data together. Um, the problem with that though is it's difficult to identify how many groups are sensible within each well and which group actually corresponds to pay. Um, so again, it, it's helpful to have multiple models working together to sort of reinforce each other. And then that last model uh, really helps, really helps um, well, it, it allows us to represent all that, that data in, in, in one place and help us sort of compare and contrast things. So, um, so that's, you know, really interesting. Um, so I'm gonna break off here a little bit and, and talk about the little visualization tool that we put together. Uh, I'm gonna, Stop sharing for a moment, and then I'm going to reshare uh, another screen. So hopefully you can see this one okay. 
So what we've got here is we put together a little dashboard because we wanted to look at as much of the data as we possibly could. So um, again, very similar to what you might expect from such a tool. Um, I just wanted to show you how we can, you know, rapidly put together uh, a little dashboard just to aid us in our analytics. This is some, something we commonly do for, for clients. Uh, very simply, you know, we can pick fields or blocks. Um, we can pick a, pick quadrants as you might expect from the Norwegian or the UK side. So just pick, pick quadrant three here. Um, it goes away, it pulls all the information from that. Um, so it's just a little proof of concept we put together. So it kind of takes a moment to load the data. Um, and as I said, like we, we did this because we were frustrated that it was hard to compare everything that we wanted to compare. It's hard to compare many, many blocks um, or fields together in the same place. So you know, it has all the things you might expect. It has you know a map which you can you know play around with. Um, it pulls the data. It we can select. You know, groups or blocks, of course, because it's a live demo, it takes a minute to fetch all the results. Um, just give it a moment. Um, and then, you know, we can pull up the well log information and, and the, the, the actual data and the predictions and um, everything you might expect. Uh, can we have the fields, please? Um, so we can get our, our data all in one place. Um, and then we can compare wells and look at our predictions and, you know, we can look at their clustering and we can look at our pay predictions and, uh, here's a good example where the, what we've identified from the clustering and what we've identified from, so that's the first and the second model, so the, the first model, the, the prediction model are are in good agreement there, for example. So we, we we would rate that as a as a good prediction just sitting in the uh, Brent formation, um, which is nice. Um, okay, I'll just give this one more second. Um, so again, we use this just to pull the, start interrogating the data in a quick way, much as you, you saw in the, the, the other presentations really, there's kind of only one way to do the, the, the main difference is this, is this output from that, uh, third model of the autoencoder, which you can see here. Um, it is of course. Being a bit tricky because it's a live demo. There we go. So what we can do here is we get this is what we what you can see is here, all the points represent one of those eighty meter intervals, um, and we can look at all the points for a particular field. Uh, and what this allows us to do is say, okay, where we make a prediction, we can label it with one of these little stars and say, okay, we're pretty confident that there's there's pay in that area. Um, and we see a diamond, we think there might be pay, and where you see just a dot, we say there's probably not pay. Uh, we can do things like just pick out a single example and say, okay, that looks kind of interesting. Um, um, so there, there, there may be pay in this interval, and then we can call up the same well below and try and compare and contrast. So that's kind of interesting. Or there may be two wells very close to each other and say, actually, do they follow the same structures? Now, um, it's kind of hard to interpret until you dig into it a little bit deeper, but I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about how to interpret this, this plot, because it's, it's kind of interesting and it's kind of not what we were expecting when we, we set out. This was just to try and compare things, uh, but it actually turned out to be really, um, really quite interesting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch back to uh, presentation and talk a little bit more about 
how 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 we went around interpreting and talking about all all these different parts. Um, so just a word on the tech stack. So that little dashboard was built in Databricks, uh, sitting on the Databricks platform, which is our sort of preferred analytical platform, uh, all built on, on and, all, and all the data was held in Microsoft Azure, um, which was hosting the, the data that was supplied by the operators uh, via SORT. Uh, also pulling together some external data from the OGA and the MPD uh, APIs. Um, we use the, the Databricks dashboards uh, as a BI tool, but if we were going to make that a sort of a slicker, more sort of commercially orientated thing, we'd probably just switch that out for something like Power BI. Um, and just just a little note to say, all all the work was done in on open source uh, data, uh, sorry, open source libraries. So again, this is should be a, a pretty reproducible project. Um, so how we actually go around predicting pay using sort of bag of bits that we have at this point. So the idea is this this 2D space thing that let me talk about the output from the autoencoder kind of makes analysis quicker, allowing us sort of our idea was we can better target someone's time prioritizing wells and where to look. So if you remember each point represents an 80 meter interval. Uh, we label our predictions within that space. Uh, once you're familiar with this space you can you can start to interrogate it quite well and you can look at multiple wells together on this plot and effect, I mean you can look at as many as you like actually although it of course starts to get cluttered at some point. Um, what it looks like is so if I take the average value from each of those 80 meter uh, points I, I can plot them out like this. Um, so you see for example the top right here we have the sonic data uh, that goes from high values at the bottom to low values at the top. Um, the deep receptivity goes from low values at the bottom left to higher values at the top right and so on and so forth. So you can think of this as a bit like a ternary plot, which a lot of you are probably quite familiar with. Um, we didn't really set out to do this. This is just kind of what came out of the autoencoder. Uh, and it turns out that actually in this sort of upper right region here is where we tend to find pay. So we very quickly can use this sort of deep, uh, dimensionality reduction idea to, to say, well, kind of if any point falls in that area, we probably actually want to spend some time looking at it. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably asking at this point, how, how do we actually go around validating that? Um, that's a, a very good question. So there's, there's no proper metric. To, to validate this data as from a data scientist's point of view. Um, that's actually quite frustrating. Um, so we, we use predictions that we've made and, and see how they look in terms of depth. We use CPI data and we use some lithology uh, information tops. Um, so we look at pay intervals. So this is called a swarm plot, if you've not come across it before. Uh, what we have here is for each of the fields, we've plotted out each of those 80 meter intervals. Uh, the lighter points are those without any predicted pay. The dark points are those with predicted pay. So we see that actually, uh, so for Brent, for example, uh, second from the left, um, a lot of the predictions come uh, within that big sort of fat lobe. That's where all the development fields are. So that's where the reservoir is. So you kind of expect it. Um, so this kind of helps us kind of validate what we're doing, where you see points outside of those main lab, uh, main sort of um, fat bits. Um, that's potentially where we may be spotting uh, missed pay, I guess. That's, that's where we m people may not be paying attention to. So again, that's, that's kind of interesting uh, as far as uh, we're concerned. Um, Moving on, so it's obviously easy to spot pay in development wells. Um, if we only look at the exploration wells, again, we're highlighting points within those sort of main reservoir areas. So this is one way that we've used to help sort of validate that our predictions are actually making sense. Um, so we're, we're quite pleased with this. Um, equally, uh, using the CPI data, it's quite limited, but we, again, we can overplot that on that uh, 2D space. Uh, so that's CPI data, just taking average values on the top. At the bottom, if we apply a set of cutoffs, um, we see that actually the net pay is all kind of co-located in, in a sort of a similar region. Um, and again, that kind of makes us think actually we're, we're doing something pretty useful. Um, and 
right at the tail end of the project, we decided, okay, we actually can apply some lithology data to what we've what we've done. And we didn't use the, this information to build the model, but um, we weren't expecting this to happen at all. But actually, it clustered really, really, really well in that, that, that data space. So again, once you understand this, you can start to interpret what's going on within a well. Uh, and not that we had time to do it at the end, but you could actually... Uh, map this information back to the wells and you know automatically label uh, your your data with lithology in a completely unsupervised way, which you know is um, is kind of interesting. Um, and similarly with the formation uh, top information, you can overplot that. And again, we weren't expecting that to cluster nearly as well as it did, but uh, but actually it it kind of makes a lot of sense. So um, so that was quite you know. Uh, it's quite encouraging. Uh, gave us a lot of confidence that what we were doing uh, made a lot of sense. And then working with our SME partners, um, again, kind of, they were able to interpret what we were doing um, uh, a lot more efficiently uh, and were able to give us sort of advice and guidance based on this. And they, they were able to interpret results too. So uh, again, really interesting, really unusual technique, um, but we're, we're sort of quite pleased with the results that actually came out of it. Um, so really just summing up, um, we've, we've used a, a real data-driven data driven approach to derive insights from, from well logs. Um, we've sort of, we were delivering a set of last files with the predictions attached. So we've got to look at that. There's a ton of supporting documentation, which is, which is pretty detailed actually. Um, so we'll slide that too. And then we have that little dashboard demo, which uh, if, if anybody's interested in sort of having a play with and uh, let us know and we can um, see what we can do. In terms of success for the project, um, really gone through quite an innovative approach, like entirely data led. So if you sort of don't ignore the data science, uh, the geoscience, but um, you, you take a, a, a data science approach first, uh, this is kind of where you end up. Uh, it's quite a very innovative. Uh, we think it's potentially quite useful. Um, there was no metrics, as I've mentioned a few times, but the fact that we're able to still validate what we did, um, I'm personally re really pleased about. Um, and the tech stack we used worked really well for this project, which is always, which always a really nice thing. Again, data engineers really uh, earning their pay. Uh, lessons learned, so collaboration, absolutely essential. Uh, we know this from the many projects we worked in across many different industries, but I think the more technical depth required in any given field, the more you need uh, SME input. Uh, that's absolutely essential. Uh, and um, yeah, can't really say uh, much more than that. The development process for this kind of project really needs to be creative, particularly at the start. If you go with a really rigid idea of what you want to do, um, we wouldn't have gone in some of the directions that, that, that we did and um, allowing that flexibility at the start. So, you know, thanks for our partners in the OGC and Merkel Aquila for, you know, allowing me and the team to, to go in all these sort of weird and different ways because um, that, that, that allows for that creativity. Um, and definitely make use of any available software. Uh, things like Welly and Lass.io, uh, big shout out to, um, to those libraries because they're essential for, for you know, developing at pace. Um, so that, you know, don't ignore it or peril, I think is the uh, lesson there. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you for sticking with me through that. Um, if you have any questions, do let me know. Uh, and again, thank you to the OGTC for uh, giving me some time to uh, talk today. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Another, absolutely, another excellent uh, presentation there. Um, I'd like to say, especially from an OGTC point of view, I think the way you did manage the project, the way you, you know, the, ag the agile style and the sort of daily, weekly sprints that, you know, that I was involved in, I think, you know, really made me feel part of the project and, you know, made me aware of what was going on at every stage. So I think it was, you know, excellently managed and I think, you know, the results look, look really great. Thank you for that, yeah. Yeah, the uh, collaborative was kind of, uh, element to this project is, uh, is sort of really important to us. So yeah, um, we're always keen to, to make sure people are uh, are engaged throughout. Okay, great. Well, okay. So I think we've got time for a, a few questions then. Um, Fantastic. Got here. Uh, questions, questions, questions. 
Sure. Okay. Ah, there we have. We do have a hand up, so we will go oh, to that if they're still on the line. This is Eros. I will click the button to allow you to talk. So, Eros, if you can unmute yourself, um, the floor is yours. No, doesn't seem to that we hand was raised very early on, so um, it doesn't seem to be happening. So we'll go back to the chat. There's quite a few were coming in there at the end. Um, right, where are we? Where's me? Right. Okay. So we'll start off here. How did you handle missing log curve segments? For example, what if your gamma ray log has a hundred foot segment missing? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So we um, simply did uh, straight line interpolations where it wasn't too large. Uh, I can't remember the actual number we used there. Um, there weren't too many large segments missing. I, did, I, I don't recall. Um, it was kind of a good enough when you're working across, you know, 150 million data points. Um, you don't necessarily need to be completely uh, slavish to uh, to accuracy in that part. I think if we were to go back though, I think if it was a large interval, we would probably do a more sophisticated imputation scheme um, to uh, to redress that. But uh, no, it's a good point. Okay, um, so did you try different architectures for the prediction model, for instance? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, many, many, many different architectures and modeling types. So everything from um, simple naive, ba uh, naive, naive Bayes models to random forests uh, and into um, doing uh, uh, deep learning models. As, as you'll know, there are uh, many, many different ways to do uh, deep learning models. So you can spend a lot of time. That's where things like Databricks re like really help. So um, there's something called MLflow, which you may or may not be familiar with. So it's a, a tool set we can use to record the output of our different modeling techniques and we can have it all displayed and visualized and we can compare all the results. So we, we use those kind of tools to help guide us um, with the modeling technique, but um, for some of the data, some of the really simple models actually work quite well, but um, partly from consistency uh, point of view, uh, and you go to the, the, and the, the deep learning models just edged out some of those simple models, but there wasn't a lot in it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and that's coming here. Oh yeah, so yeah, this 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 eight the eighty meet the eighty meter interval. How did we um, come around to? Uh, so uh, if I remember right, we probably tried everything from about ten meters to a hundred meters. Um, eighty meters was good because it gave enough resolution um, to make predictions and to show interesting, um, how should I say it, interesting um, shape, shapes effectively in that uh, 2D plot from the third model um, without over cluttering the plot. It was really from a practicality point of view. Um, so we could see what we needed to see, but it didn't, we, didn't over the, we didn't over clutter the plot. Having said that, something like 10 meters actually works really well and we if we were to go back and, 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 and maybe do like a case study around a particular field, for example, um, we would probably use something like a 10 meter interval because again, that gives enough resolution for maybe start getting at those thin bed things that we've, we've heard about several times. How difficult is it to update your models then for the changed interval as well? Oh, it's, it's, it's changing from an, uh, an eight to a one and rerunning it. Okay. <laughs> You could play around it. Yeah, so we, we, we can play around that. It, take, it takes a bit of time to train, to uh, retrain the model. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not too long. So, um, again, we, that's, that's something can be turned around relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. So, can you explain how you determined your confidence levels for the pay flags? <laughs> Good question. So, I said there are 
it's incredibly difficult to do that because we don't have a pay indicator across the whole data set. Mm -hmm. um, where we can create it, there's about 200 CPI logs, I think, were, were usable. A lot had things like uh, negative values and uh, values like like more than 100% and things like that. So, you know, <laughs> um, difficult to know without the... Um, Without the documentation, very difficult to know what what was going on in those. Um, so from that data set, yeah, we could be we're fairly confident in our results if we just take that. When we apply it back to the overall data set, actually, it's um, it's 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 a bit trickier. So we're really using those different data sets to try and validate what it was we're doing. Um, again. I think the best way to do that would be to work closely with a team who know a particular data set really, really well and apply that data set to these techniques uh, and see what comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so really get a hand, handle on what we mean by pay and then really mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. I think that sort of came out a bit in the first talk as well. It's yeah. like, what is the definition of pay, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It's like, um, yeah, tricky. Yeah. Um, that's so great. Okay. Uh, depth of burial compaction has an influence on the separation of clusters and petrophysical log measurements. Was depth included as a feature in the clustering approaches? Uh, good question. Um, depth was not included as a feature. Um, from the point of view of reducing bias, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, but there's a Bit of a correlation between uh, depth and uh, pay intervals within the data sets. Um, so that's both a good thing and a bad thing. So we we felt that if we included depth, then it would skew the results in a particular direction. Uh, so we we chose not to do that. Um, didn't seem to make too much of a difference anyway. If if you did try with it in, um, there's also a little bit of issue about how the the, the depth matching worked. Um, I know SORD are undertaking an exercise to redress that in the data set at the moment. So actually when they publish their new data set, if, if, if we have time and money, we, we, we may try rerunning everything with that information just so we can have a more confidence. It was more, it was more down to the fact we have not fantastic confidence over, over the consistency of that depth measurement across the whole data set. Um, so again, there's, there's, so there's a few different reasons we didn't use it, but yeah, I, I I, I understand um, where you're coming from. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a good point with the new batch of data from sort of think, yeah, I'd all like to see if that makes a difference, you know, trying to provide that sort of standard mm -hmm. nice depth right across you know, the area. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's, oh, it's a more general question. Given your experience in other industries, uh, this is gospel, what is your honest opinion of the level of the level data and analytics in the oil and gas industry compared to other industries. Uh, so do you Great see question. Yeah. similarities to other industries where oil and gas could learn something? I mean, you, you referenced some of the financial sectors, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. So honest opinion, uh, oil and gas has a lot of data, but I think this project is probably a really good example of it. Um, the lack of consistency uh, between operators, uh, between collecting standards and things like that, uh, really hurt individuals' ability to do machine learning projects. Within companies, it probably works okay. Um, and I know there's a lot of companies who have very sophisticated teams, and there are some companies that are only starting to get get to grips with it. So like a lot of different industries, there's there's a broad spectrum of um, what where where companies are at with their data. Um, we, we worked with a, a few now, everything from just getting the data infrastructure right for purpose, fit for purpose. Um, that's transitioning from a lot of cloud-based uh, to a lot of cloud-based solutions now, which, which we see as, 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 a, as a positive thing. Um, the, the key really is not to hire a data science team doing advanced analytics before you've got some of that er earlier work done. Because um, as, as I tried to stress, the data engineers make my job kind of possible, I guess. Um, uh, so you, you kind of need to go up through that 
sort of complexity from doing getting the data you know sorted into into like reporting and dashboarding and things like that and then you can start getting into the more exotic things that's that's where it works the best um where we see that worked really well are places like so finance is a good example um and you can see with like the uh open the open banking initiative um so even the the banks are starting to get to the idea where actually if they can have standards they can share data and then you know we can start doing more and more um interesting uh analytics and things so uh, I, I think that's a a good model uh, one could work with if if uh, uh although finance is maybe not popular with everyone <laughs> Okay. Um, well, we've just got a couple more if we've got time to um, have a look, just answer these. It's another, this one here has just come in. The earth science, I guess this is earth science and analytics, um, is much more complex than, a, sorry, the earth, sorry, no, no, it's not, it's, but I think it says the earth, the science within the earth is much more complex than a binary system. Mm -hmm. you think? EA would be a useful tool in oil and gas in the future. Uh, I'm guessing that's data analytic, uh, data yeah. analytics. Yeah, sorry. I, um, absolutely. So, yeah, you're right. It, it's an incredibly complex system. Uh, the the key is asking the right questions. So, um, to derive value from data, you, you you need to ask good questions. Um, and trying to understand what it is you're you're really trying to do um it's it's where deep learning is is a bit of an advantage um because it can model very complex interactions and you have a lot of data there's tons of data in oil and gas that's fantastic that makes all these exotic techniques possible uh and uh and and something you, you you know you can actually use the downside is interpretability but you, you know you're you're never going to go off and do something you're, you're not going to go drill somewhere without you know someone checking so um the these sort of deep learning uh models you know get at those complex interactions um which which are difficult to understand but you know that's 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 the power of them so may it's it's not a binary system but you know you can you can try and tease that out by asking the right kinds of questions okay okay and then finally um what metric did you use for cluster distance um so i was mostly using uh silhouette scores um to look at that there what else was i doing and obviously there are, there are many different metrics um uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you've got me on the hop so silhouette score is, is 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 one way of doing that there there are obviously many uh metrics uh the deep embedded clustering that i was looking at uh, that i was discussing uh really interesting technique that kind of forces a kind of a k-means um approach uh which is you know um kind of preferable due to its simplicity um i recommend people go and look that up because actually it's pretty cool um, and was really fun to do okay well i think uh that's all from the chat box i like to say i just like to say um once again thank you very much stephen for uh Absolutely excellent talk and the excellent work that Mark and Akita have done. And uh, likewise to our other um, presenters today from Earth Science Analytics. I think, you know, uh, we've been really looking forward to the results of these uh, projects and they, they haven't disappointed. Um, up on the screen now is some contact details from Earth Science Analytics and there's Stevens from uh, Merkel. If um, you have any questions you would like to fire them or um, myself at the OGTC. And also a quick reminder of what was mentioned at the beginning of this um, webinar that um, the Norwegian Petroleum Director under their force.org um, that are doing this uh, sort of two that this machine learning contest and the link to the website is there on the screen. Um, this recording will be made available in due course by the OGTC website. So please look out on um, social media and 
also say along with the post about the availability of the conditioned data. Um, as for, I guess, the, an the analytics, as I said at the beginning, the, the, the results from the analytics are, are going to be reviewed by our um, sponsor companies. So, you know, and again, you know, in a few months time, I guess we will be able to understand maybe how these projects have highlighted any potential missed opportunities so we could get a handle on you know, you know what incremental reserves they had potentially identified okay so well once again thank you for everyone's time today and tuning in and um hope to uh be bringing you some more information about these projects in the near future thank you for listening goodbye